All right, well, welcome everyone to November's uh, pickup meeting. And today we uh, just thought we would share with everyone what we've been up to, um, what things you've tried during the semester, what seems to have worked well, what maybe you would like some advice or feedback on. Um, and just to get us started, I'd, I'll say that this semester, when I did the falling sphere in my intro physics class, I did it in two dimensions. And so I really emphasized the fact that the uh, resistive force goes opposite the direction of the velocity. And that seems to have gone really well. And I really liked the conceptual part of it because it was the first time that we, you know, usually we, we just talk about vectors, but then we break up every problem into an X and a Y. And this was the first time where the students actually had to kind of think about the two dimensions together rather than splitting it into parts. Um, so I think it, it went really well and I'm going to keep it that way for future semesters. So opening up the floor, <laughs> would anybody else like to tell us about what they've done? I'll, I'll give a comment. Um, so in my intro E&M course, um, one thing that I was happy with this semester is the students seem to uh, become, I, I don't know if comfortable is the right thing, but they seem to um, want to and would make use of um, SymPy, which is Python's uh, um, symbolic uh, math uh, library, um, to do integrals and solve um, systems of coupled equations. Um, so that's something that I told them repeatedly is okay, we're at this point, there's an integral to be done. You can do this by hand using the stuff from calculus, or you can use a computer. I don't care what way you do it. Um, and the students became willing to do that on their own um, without me specifically telling them to. Um, so I was happy with that. Cool. I tried to do something kind of like that when I was, I'm teaching modern physics. And I tried to incorporate Mathematica into the course, although I don't think my students got to the point where they on their own would go off and say solve homework problems doing Mathematica unless I explicitly suggested this problem such that you want to do that. I think and my students would probably need more more practice first or more comfort, higher level of um, comfort with it. And, and I will say that at the same time that the students were taking this class, most of the students were also taking our um, sort of intro to computation that's taught in our department. And in that class, they became comfortable with the environment just opening up the environment, doing things in the environment. So the things that I introduced them to was the physics stuff and specifically using that SymPy library. Um, so I, I think that did have a lot to do with the fact that they were willing to do that on their own because there was less of a barrier to overcome um, with being uncomfortable just opening up this thing. What is your intro to comp class like? Um, so I've taught it lots of semesters, but I'm not teaching it this semester. Um, uh, but it is introductory, and in it, uh, it's Python-based, and they do um, physics and scientific computing problems. Um, so data analysis, simulating things with the Euler algorithm, um, that kind of stuff. Dave, I'm curious to know whether this was the first time that you tried integrating computation into that class and, and what kinds of activities they were doing. I did a pilot test of it over the summer when I just had four students in a summer course. And with those four students, I felt it worked better perhaps because um, with 20 students, I feel like I'm rushing around everyone, you know, at some emergency because it's you know, they're not familiar with Mathematica or whatever it is. But it, it seemed to work well over the summer. The activities I had them do were a lot of graphing. So for example, with wave functions, you can look at different energy levels and maybe have Mathematica show what is the most probable value for um, some observable with uh, different uh, quantum numbers of the wave function and so forth. So it was a lot of visualization and a little bit of integration. Nice. Larry, can I ask what you think of SymPy? Because um, I introduced it in my computational physics class just as I think like um, like one day I showed them how to use it and I said that you know they can use it if they would like um, and didn't really follow through with it. Um, so I haven't used it a lot, but 
from what I saw, it looks like it Hello. can do a lot of what you need it to do, but it's not as, um, like, uh, if you actually wanted to do um, symbolic calculus, like Mathematica is the way to go. Um, so what did you think? Um, I, I think it's for the things that you are done in undergraduate physics, um, I think it's perfectly good. Um, I think Mathematica um, is sure to beat it when you come to doing very fancy math stuff. Uh, but in terms of its mathematical capabilities, uh, I think it's not lacking in any way that I would care about. Um, and when used inside of a Jupyter Notebook, you get the pretty output of things. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm happy with it. Um, and I think it's simple enough in terms of syntax that students don't find that to be off-putting. Thank you. Yeah, good. Would somebody else like to share what they've tried this semester? All right, um, sure. Um, so for me, it was the first uh, time using Jupyter Notebooks. Um, I'm coordinating the University of Physics One lab course. Uh, so that's four sections with up to 24 students each. Um, they are taught not by me, but uh, by our grad students. And so what I did was I uh, added some computational components to three out of 13 labs. Um, actually, one lab was entirely focused on computation. Um, that was about uh, uh, measurement error statistics. And then uh, I added a computational component to two other labs. One uh, is um, free fall with air drag, where we uh, have the students drop uh, cupcake liners, uh, one, two, three, four, five stack liners, and they uh, use Logger Pro to record the video, they analyze the video, and uh, then uh, as an additional activity, uh, I had them well, integrate the equations of motion. Um, and then the last activity was uh, analysis of a simple pendulum motion. Uh, so with uh, computational physics, you can see what happens if you go beyond the small angle approximation, go to initial angles of 45, 50, 60, 70, 80 degrees. Um, and then uh, after those uh, three computational labs, I did a survey and um, about half of the students uh, in the lab actually res uh, responded and uh, a lot of them hated it. Oh no! <laughs> um, Did they give particular reasons uh, why? Did it find? Out? Well, it, it was uh, interesting. So um, one answer was get rid of it. With no previous coding experience and no crash course in it, makes the entire lab more challenging than it has to be. Um, or. Um, Someone said something like, uh, uh, I'm not a physics major and half the class are, are not. Um, we, we don't uh, ever need computation. The interesting thing, though, is that half the class are engineering majors. Oh. <laughs> that work. So perhaps, yeah, perhaps trying a little bit more scaffolding and a little bit more uh, being upfront with the why. I, 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 I think so, and, and we, we definitely have to work on students' expectation. Um, one thing I, I can do, if, if anyone is interested, I, I can share the Jupyter Notebooks uh, that uh, uh, I was using. Let me see if I can copy. Um, let me see if that shows up as a clickable link in the chat. Not sure. Uh, let's give it a try. Yep, I see a lot of links. Uh, yep. Mm -hmm. Do you plan to put them on pickup? Um, I'll, I'll have to see. I, I might, although I think uh, many of them are very similar to stuff that's already there. Okay, so for example, uh, the, the free fall is something that I actually partly uh, adapted from uh, uh, Kelly's uh, Jupyter Notebook. And uh, I think pen Pendulum is also there. Yeah. This is great, Axel. I just clicked on the last one. Um, I would say I would encourage you to at least post it on Slack. 
um, so that it, it's there as a permanent okay. uh, mm -hmm. message. And then, you know, I, I think, you know, we'll, we'd have to look through in a little bit more detail and see if mm -hmm, mm -hmm, sure. um, either add them as variations on an exercise set or as a new exercise set. Maybe mm -hmm. Larry can. So these all look complete. Did, did you have any code that's there provided for them um, when they started these assignments? Um, so the, 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 these are what I posted are the instructor versions. So there, there are a number of activities, exercises uh, in there um, that the students uh, have to do. So the, the first thing uh, I have to uh, have them do is simply add some comments to existing code. Um, and uh, then the next thing is they, they um, copy some existing code, how, how to generate a plot, how, how to generate a histogram, for example. Uh, so they, they don't have to do, uh, have to write, they don't have to write code from scratch. It's mostly just um, copying and slightly modifying existing code. Nice, very nice. Thank you for for sharing, Axel. Mm -hmm, sure. <clears throat> Do we have other volunteers? So I just want to say I'm sorry. I'm usually really chatty, but I'm teaching a computer science class this semester, so I don't like I do a lot of coding, obviously. <laughs> the purpose but it's a little bit different so I'm more listening give us a highlight a highlight of the class yeah like something that blew you away that the students did or mm. that you well one thing well. I thought was super cool is uh so I like even when I was doing computation for my PhD is computational science so we did some really cool assignments like uh, we did a Twitter sentiment analysis and we also did a network analysis. So find like the most central person in a certain network. And so like we did one with Paul Revere and that sort of thing. And uh, I just thought it was really cool how we're, uh, we're, they're using the same methods that we're using in physics classes. I mean, they aren't, they don't really have differential equations in that class, but they still have, you know, a lot of uh, linear algebra and that sort of thing. Um, but applied to, to things that I think are really catchy for non-scientists. So it was fun to, to see those uh, applications. Yeah, nice. I have a question or comment for those of you who um, use scientific programming in your introductory courses. Um, I suspect a lot of you are using matter and interactions or something similar. So I've, a lot of my computational assignments in my introductory physics course this semester um, involve momentum updating and then position updating in the usual way, like using a modified Euler algorithm. And I think students had maybe five or six um, assignments in class or in lab where they did that. And I didn't get the sense that students really knew better on the last time than the first time. Like if I tell them, I, I give them a comment that says, okay, this is where in the code you're going to update the momentum. This is where in the code you're going to update the position. And I still felt that students didn't remember, first of all, that update means you take the old value and use it to calculate a new value. And secondly, that they knew what to do with it. So I would have thought that after seeing it six times doing the same thing, that they would have had some recollection. But it seemed like they just sort of every time just got stuck. What do we do? How do we update momentum? And they would just start guessing. Put it in an exam. I was tempted to have like a lab exam or something where it yeah, um, that's, be that's what I do because I find that students, I mean, the, the, the engaged students will pay attention and want to understand no matter what, but for the students that really are in the class, um, you know, wanting to get something from it, but mostly just to get a good grade and move on, they're not so much paying attention to the whys and the hows, they're just trying to get through. Um, but knowing that it's going to be on the exam prompts them to look into it a little bit more and make sure that they understand what's happening. And so for all of the labs, I have a little exam component um, so that they see that, you know, it, this is important. You should understand how this works. And if you don't, then should, you should ask questions. It shouldn't just be, oh, you know, because my partner said so, I put it in here and got the lab completed. So when you say all of your labs have an exam component, do you mean each lab individually or all your lab courses? Um, 
all of my courses where I do computation, and I'm, in particular, I was thinking about my modern physics course, where I actually have time to do lab exams. Um, but anytime I introduce computation, I have something on the exam that relates back. And it can be, you know, even something really simple, like giving them a little bit of piece of code and asking them, what does this do? Um, or maybe writing, like with what you were saying, you could have them write a little bit of pseudocode with how you would update things. Um, in, the, in the lab exams, I actually have them code as part of the exam. But I would be happy if my students could, given a force, um, update momentum of position and also understand where those equations come from, relating them to Newton's second law. That, that's a big step. Well, I have something um, that I'd like to get some feedback on, if that's okay. Sure. <clears throat> so I'm teaching um, a sophomore level, you know, Python lab course for physics majors this semester for the first time. The course is new and it's going to be taught every semester from now on. And um, uh, for the final project, I kind of settled on a format that I feel kind of pleased with, but I, um, you know, I'd like to know what sort of what, uh, how to make it better if, if possible. So what I did was I um, created a list of competencies that I wanted students to show with their final project that they could do these various things. And I said, you can write one to three programs that cover your that include your competencies and um, you know, if you can do this many, then you get a C and if you can do this many, you get a B and this many and an A. Um, and I felt, I guess I felt good about that because, because if it's a, um, you know, I want it to be a creative um, effort, but I've struggled with how to evaluate creative um, products. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so, I mean, it's maybe a little bit artificial but I'm like, you know, go ahead and like make your, make your program do this extra like gratuitous thing just so that you can show me that you know how to do it. Um, and then I've also give them like a list of scenarios or like problems out of Newman's book just to say, here's, here are the pre-approved problems and however you want to go about this so that, you, so that you can cover your competencies, then go for it. And are they currently in the process of working on this? Yeah, uh, they're starting to sort of conceive how they're going to do this. <clears throat> yeah, so, um, you know, one, one weakness that I can possibly foresee, I mean, it might happen, it might obtain, is that, like, The trick is to get all these things working together, right? It's not, it's not to do all the little parts, right? Use a for loop, right? But it's, it's to use a for loop strategically, you know, in a way that's, that actually advances you towards your objective. Um, and so I don't have a way to evaluate that right now. I don't see how I'm gonna so do that. Really. Is, is using for loops a competency or I guess I was thinking on a like more one out of 50 um, but I guess I was thinking like uh, like Euler's method or like something more like mathematical so they're like specific programming um, tasks that they should be able to do is that how it's broken up yeah I mean I've got other things like that um, You know, uh, <clears throat> edit data for a vPython shape in a while loop, you know, uh, in an anim you know, for an animation. So it's not saying exactly what, it's not saying that you have to have um, any physics statement in particular. Um, you know, one of the competencies is write a statement that, you know, that expresses a law of physics. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's it's a it is a shot. It's a 
What kinds of problems are they to encounter? Um, well, so I, I said, oh, um, uh, you know, model the electric field due to a finite length, uh, uniformly charged rod, um, or, you know, illustrate the effect of quadratic air resistance on a, a particle moving in at least two dimensions, or things from things from Newman. You know Newman's book. I don't. Well, okay, so there's well, like a, you know, it's like a binary search thing. Well, I mean, or it's, it doesn't have to be a binary search, but um, where you're searching for, um, you know, a solution to a fifth order polynomial or, um, you know, building a sodium chloride lattice or, mm, i trying to remember what else there is. Okay. Yeah. Because um, I, mean, I think as, as Michelle was also saying that there's different ways of looking at competencies. The way I've, um, structure my labs is um, they have a problem and if they get to so much of the problem then that's a C and if in addition they do you know so so I have them do this one lab where they have to model a two-step system and so there's this particle bouncing around and they can go up and down this step and so if they can get that working that's a C if right. in addition they can take uh, data for different heights and you know plot it in a way that makes sense that's a B. If in addition right. they can extract parameters from the data, then that's an A. So it's right. not so much looking at, um, you know, individual coding things, but at how much of a problem they can actually. Sure, know, that, that makes sense. sense, and that reminds me of of Aaron Titus's um, yes frameworks that he Very uses. Very much like that. Um, and I I think for a situation where I'm specifying the problem that makes sense mm -hmm. you know, for a final project. Oh, I thought it'd be better to do something more open-ended. So I'll say that I use Newman's book for my computational physics class. We work all the way through it and then they have a final project at the end that they write a proposal for and they get feedback and, um, and then they have their first code submission, get feedback, and then their final code submission, and then they do a presentation as well. But I also struggle with that final project on um, uh, assessment, since everyone has chosen good projects by the end because they're receiving feedback along the way, but then uh, they're also different. Uh, that's something that I struggle with, so I don't have yeah. a solution, but I think it's maybe along the lines of the same problem. Yeah, right. I think it's an interesting question that you had at the beginning, Hunter, of um, if you list out all of those competence, competencies, and you said about 50, um, what that list should consist of in general. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's a question that has been answered um, or that necessarily everyone would agree on. Yeah. Well, and also, I mean, I, I'm trying to, I'm feeling the tension, you know, I'm not, I'm not hating it. It's fine. Um, between students who, you know, have done zero with computers, I mean, with, with um, computer programs before the semester and others who have, you know, taken a course in C++ or something. Um, so I'm really trying to, <clears throat> I'm, I'm kind of aiming at those because this is a required course for physics majors and minors and it's designed. It, I, I see it, I see the course as being um, remedial in a way, you know, that it's meant to catch, it's meant to get everybody up above a certain minimum level of ability so that they can, so that they can go into their upper division courses and they can be assigned this or that, you know, particular problem by those instructors and be, be reasonably expected to do that. So, so Larry, um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know that this addresses the, sa the exact same kind of skills, but I just pulled out the AAPT guidelines for, what does it call, recommendations for computational physics. And they do have a table that lists kind of competencies that physics majors should have. Of course, you know, this is at the end of their undergrad, not at the sophomore level. Um, but I, does that, I, I don't recall, I don't think that breaks down 
-hmm. It does. So it has things like students should be able to produce static visualizations of data. Uh, students should be uh, able to create databases effectively for information. Uh, let's see. Those are bigger picture kind of Yeah, those are kind of bigger picture, but maybe it would help a little bit with the assessment in that you're not necessarily saying you have to have, you know, a for loop, an if statement, etc. But, you know, rather bigger picture. So if a problem, right, if a problem is better attacked one way than another, you're not losing points because you're not putting that computational syntax or whatever that's called in. It's more, were you able to solve the problem? Um, so anyway, maybe. Yeah, yeah Mari, I, I, I agree with you. It's, it, it's, the way I've set it up makes it possibly a little forced. Um, but also, I told them to do one to three, sort of one to three programs to sort of show all the things that they can do. And so yeah. maybe, you know, this is not appropriate for this problem, but it's, an, it's appropriate for another problem or, um, anyway. <clears throat> I, I think that sounds, sounds interesting and doable. Yeah. I don't know what the students, you know, might, might think, but. Yeah, I don't know either. Yeah, good. Well, maybe we can have another, um, another uh, update from you after the semester. Yeah. So I, I, I just want to say thanks for, thanks for uh, pointing out the APT uh, guidelines thing. And it's something that uh, we should definitely think about for our program as a whole. Mm -hmm. sure. See, anybody else want to jump in and tell us about their course or ask questions? Uh, I guess I can um, say something about SimPy question that was talked about earlier. Uh, right this semester, I'm teaching a, a standalone computational physics course. And I think like Michelle, I also kind of briefly told students about SimPy. Uh, but some really took and ran with it. And they did things that I myself wasn't aware uh, that you could do. So I think uh, Larry pointed out that uh, it seemed like you could do a lot of stuff. Um, uh, some, for example, try to even solve inequalities, non-trivial inequalities with SimPy. So um, one student, I think she's really expert in, uh, she dug very deep into it. So uh, that uh, I actually made a, <laughs> A group, a Google group for the class, so they could post their tips and uh, uh, tricks and whatnot. And so um, uh, it's, it's very useful, it's more useful than I thought they would find. In particular, I think, uh, uh, I'm not sure your experience, but um, uh, the average student in my class, um, they are not the strongest in terms of analytic proofs. Um, and SimPy seems to really help them a lot. Yeah, and actually the things that I have used it for, um, had students use it for, or actually uh, let the students know they could use it for, is doing symbolic calculus, um, integrating, differentiating, and solving systems of equations. Um, and that's pretty much it in terms of what I've um, told students Here's this tool you can use. How does this compare to say Mathematica or Wolfram Alpha? I would have thought that Wolfram Alpha is web-based and so people can just type things in even with spelling mistakes or missing backups and you'd still be able to do integrals. So, okay, let's see. Yeah, that's a good question about Wolfram Alpha. Um, I mean, in terms of Mathematica, say the two differences, one is cost, that if, if you don't have a mathematical license, they can use it. Um, and the other is just what they're already using. Um, and whatever thing they're already using, this provides them the opportunity to use it in Python if they're using Python. 
Um, but yeah, I'm not sure how it compares to Wolfram Alpha. And you're right, Wolfram Alpha um, is free, right? Um, I don't know if others have had experience that can compare those. Uh, well, I think uh, Mathematica or the Wolfram Alpha, they, are, they seem to be more, more powerful. Um, but uh, for SimPy, um, I like it is uh, in the, uh, within the Python family of Python environment. So they could do this in Jupyter Notebook. Uh, they could do it, uh, you know, uh, on terminal commands. And so I think there's just, just better integration. Um, but for some, I think the dedicated, uh, you know, tasks, uh, probably Mathematica uh, is, is better than SimPy. Well, from Alpha, you can only do one thing at a time. Is that right? I think so. So you can put in an integral or you can put in a plot, but you can't really do kind of three rows of thing or three different things. Um, so it's, uh, it's really good. I, I use it a lot for integrals just because, you know, you can put in an integral and do it. But I think if you wanted to integrate and then maybe plot the function, um, then it starts getting a little bit more cumbersome. It also limits the amount of computer time you can use at a time. So for something very complex, it sometimes tells you you've run out of time and you don't know <laughs> it's going to run out until it already has. Yeah, well, I guess I haven't tried complex things. Yeah. Good to know, though. For me, I was wondering, not because I thought it would be like an equal to Mathematica or Wolfram Alpha, but if they're learning Python in computational physics and they learn symbolic Python, like is it sufficient or are they going to have to go into an upper level class and use uh, and learn Mathematica, which we just spent time learning how to do the same thing in a different language? Like, is it worth it to teach SimPy was kind of where I was going, but I guess it totally depends on your, like what you're trying to do with the tool. Yeah, if I can comment uh, on this, uh, uh, some student figured out that you could use say, uh, uh, an, uh, an analytic expression from SimPy and then uh, use a function called lambda phi. So you can, that becomes a regular function you can call from your uh, Python uh, code. So uh, I didn't know that was possible, but uh, turned out to be a pretty nifty feature. Well, I'm curious now, we have 12 participants. How many of you were using Python in your courses? Maybe just raise your hand, I'll count. <laughs> okay, all of the ones in the current screen and everyone but one and two people that don't have video. Oh, there comes Deva, she raised her hand. So yeah, let's see. I, I used two. And, you, and you, Jay, you use it too, okay. So maybe everybody but one. Um, so I guess that's the thing. <laughs> so, so who is that, and what uh, what uh, are you using? Are you talking about me? Well, uh, so in my physics four hundred two class, I use Mathematica. Uh, well, mainly because uh, you have the capability of doing symbolic algebra, numerical mathematics, and the plotting, which of course you can also do in Python with Matplotlib and things like that. Uh, it just happens to be what I use for my research as well. So there's some synergy there. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah. I've been using uh, VPython in my intro class, but I, I typically use MATLAB in my sophomore modern physics class just because there's a lot of engineers in it. Um, and I do think there's a lot of value also in students seeing different packages, right? So that by the end of their undergrad, they've done MATLAB and Mathematica and uh, Python and, um, you know, LabVIEW and whatever else you can throw at them. It can be difficult if, uh, unless it's within the context of a course. So I was going to ask how people feel about trying to embed computation in ordinary courses versus just having dedicated courses. So uh, what was I going to say? Uh, you know, for, for example, I'm teaching on uh, well, University Physics 1 here at the University of North Dakota. And students have so many problems coming in. We lose one third of the students anyway. 
or even without trying to do anything funny. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, they grapple with units. They don't realize that you need to write the left-hand side of equations before starting a working. They don't understand the meaning of the equal sign. Uh, you will have people doing something equals something and then multiply by two equals something else. Uh, so it seems that of all those uh, habits that we need to fix and to just teach them the language and how to think. So uh, one, I did take some baby steps, including uh, the, the screen sharing work here. Uh, can I try screen share? Sure. Let's see. Oh, how does it work? Uh, desktop? No. Thank you. Oh, this. Yes. Does that work? That worked. Yeah, so this uh, I did just yesterday, in fact. It took about 30 minutes of the class to get the students to fill out the table for basically Euler's method. Or what you call the modified Euler method, I think, for calculating the motion of a projectile or rather an object in free fall. Mm-hmm. And then on the next page, the same thing with a mass on a spring. Do you see my cursor? Yep. Yeah, so if they do this correctly, it's all actually integer algebra because uh, I chose one for all the constants and uh, they end up getting oscillations going from one zero minus one minus one zero to plus one and repeating again. So that's something that's possible to do by hand without uh, too much tedious calculator work. And I was actually quite pleased that I think I walked around the class to see how they were progressing and I think they all did very well. Maybe a couple of people got confused about which numbers to combine. But uh, we sorted out pretty quickly and they got the graphs. So what I didn't get to do was to run some kind of assessment or even a survey to ask, did you enjoy or appreciate that activity? So you know, at least Axel managed to get feedback. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so I'd be interested to hear, you know, how do you decide whether to do this again, to, to go further or to stop doing it? I have a question for you. Um, was this entirely uh, on paper or did you have them also do this in a spreadsheet? This was entirely on paper. Okay. The, I think this kind of thing um, would serve as a nice opportunity to then um, show the power of a spreadsheet even without um, doing it in a programming language. Um, hmm that you do something repeatedly over and over and over again, and then you can show them that, hey, you can magically fill in all of these once you've done it um, on a given line. But I think that looks very nice. I tried uh, for the first time using Excel to do that. Normally, I only use Excel for plots and data analysis, but um, inspired by some of Rooster's uh, items on pickup, I had them do updating, position updating in, in Excel. And I'm not, one challenge of that is, you then have to deal with Excel's obscure ways of referring to other cells, like D6, instead of referring um, to... You can name them now, as I found out not too long ago. Um, you say that again? You can name, uh, you can name cells now. and so they I, I think of- I did. I mean, I did have, or to some extent, I had a control panel where I said, okay, this constant has a name. And, you know, yeah. so I, I perhaps didn't implement that as, as fully as I could have. But I, in the end, I wasn't sure that it was really less obscure doing it that way than it would have been just to use uh, my usual Python and Glow script method. So for the rest of the semester, I use Python. But to get at the original question, um, I've been giving my students a survey at the end of the first semester. So after they've they've had maybe two labs that uses this and maybe six recitation sections where we do programming. And I haven't looked at this semester surveys yet because grades aren't in yet. So I was going to um, submit grades and then do it. But last year, I found out that from the written survey that the students find uh, homework very frustrating if it involves any kind of coding because they don't have the skills needed to debug it. And so they can spend hours just getting bogged down and trying to do something very simple. And if they had five minutes with a TA or an instructor, they could get past that. So based on that student feedback, I eliminated all the, the homework from the courses. So it, it might be useful to ask the students, you know, what is the most frustrating thing? What is the most helpful thing? And I found it useful. Hmm. I see, thanks. So do a survey. Okay. Yeah. One thing I also wanted to mention when you talked about the equal sign, um, I, I'll have to look it up 
look it up and I'll, I'll post it on Slack. But there was a really interesting article I found a while ago about why the equal sign is so confusing. And it has to do with the fact that we use it in many different ways. Sometimes we use it to define something. Sometimes we use it to, impl uh, to imply causation. Um, right. And there's, so this article just listed all of the different ways that we, that we use the equal sign and how uh, for people that are experienced, you know, which, you know what you mean <laughs> when you say equals, but for somebody who's starting out, it can be really confusing that uh, we're using the equal signs in so many different ways. Um, so I found it helpful to then be able to explain to students, um, oh, this equal means you know, we're using it this way and this equal means we're using it this other way. Um, so I'll try yeah. to find it and post it. I think their lack of understanding is much more rudimentary than even that. <laughs> My department's trying something that may be a bit wacky. We just did program review and we decided we wanted to create a math methods course, but we it's, I think it's going to be a combination of math methods and computational methods because we're going to try to integrate Mathematica. So this is, we, we designed it so that they would take it at the same time they're taking University Physics 2, which is second semester either of their first year or second year. And so they'd be taking it concurrently with their second physics course. And that does limit how much math we can do because they won't have had differential equations or even necessarily vector calc. But um, we were hoping that giving them some Mathematica experience early on, then we're teaching classical mechanics or modern physics or quantum mechanics that we can then, we know that they'll have had some mathematic experience and also get some mathematical methods along the way. But to do that, we had to sacrifice our second semester of classical mechanics. So we pay a price for that, but we'll see how that goes. We haven't tried it yet. Is this starting this year or next year? Yeah. I think it could be pretty useful. But you know, the trouble with trying to teach anything is we want to think about it as a, as a linear system where students go through this course and then this course and then the next course. But really to get good at this, you have to layer it. So for example, we are doing University Physics 1 from Showway and Jewett. So uh, we do uniformly accelerated motion. And then there's a bit of a chapter where they talk about damped motion and they say, you don't know how to solve differential equations. So we'll guess the solution and we'll check that it works. And then you have a mass on the spring and we say, you don't know how to solve differential equations. So here's the answer, check that it works. And I said, you know, if you guys are getting frustrated with that approach, uh, at least know that uh, there is something called numerical methods. And probably a good idea to have a course on that Having that together with math methods will be excellent. Our math department um, offers a course in numerical analysis, which I think does like shooting methods and equation solving methods and, and stuff like that. And quite a few of our physics majors take it because they, it can satisfy the elective for either a math major or math minor. I think it also sounds like a really great idea to put them together because when I teach computational physics, I oft so students may or may not have had math methods before or they're taking it concurrently so um i so they haven't learned how to solve pdes or odes yet i teach them how to solve them on a computer and then i say you're going to love rangakata whenever you learn how to solve this by hand um because it's so easy um but, you know, if they're in a class where they're learning it, then they're like, oh, I know what you're talking about. And otherwise, they just have to, like, trust me. So I'm like, I'm not going to teach you this because you will learn this elsewhere. So it's, you know, a waste of time um, or it's redundant. But putting those together then kind of makes sure everyone's learning all that at the same time. And it's correlated. We haven't heard from Todd or Saruj, uh, or Saruj is that right? Saruj, um, yeah, that's, Mike that's wasn't right. working. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually working now. Oh, good. yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't. A, I don't know if it was a mic, but it was certainly uh, audio. I wasn't getting any sound. I switched, I switched computers. So, 
Yeah, I missed uh, quite a bit at the beginning. I could I could see you, but I couldn't hear you. But so I'm sure you were talking about very lots of very interesting things. Um, yeah, so I can add. Um, so typically, I teach um, uh, this semester would be the semester I would teach our computational physics uh, course. It's a sophomore course. Um, we call it scientific programming. Um, and it's taken by all physics majors. Um, and we, um, uh, in fall of their um, sophomore year. Uh, this semester, I'm not teaching it. Uh, someone else is teaching it. I, I, they gave me, um, I kind of requested it, uh, an uh, uh, upper level uh, thermodynamics. Um, and um, I, so it was since the pickup meeting that I came to, um, two summers ago, this was my first chance to introduce um, some programming element in uh, an upper level course. Um, and so, so I gave it, gave one assignment that involved um, some coding, coding. It was uh, a spin a half power magnetic system. And I, I, I sort of, I, I wrote the notes for it um, and um, some, some code, um, just the start of the, the code for the solution um, in, using Jupyter Notebook. Um, and so what they had to do was um, for a spin a half system with n, n, n particles, um, determine magnetization, internal energy, um, uh, uh, entropy, and from that uh, uh, come up with uh, determine a temperature. And they were supposed to um, graph each quantity as they um, calculated it. Um, and then they were supposed to um, um, generate a table. So, so, so all of the quantities were generated um, uh, as uh, Python lists were calculated using Python lists, and they, in the end, they generated a table with all of the quantities. And I had some mistakes in the um, deliberate mistakes in the in the Python notebook that I gave them um, to 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 use, and. Um, and and uh, and the first uh, question I got from it is was do they have to use Python because some of them had never used Python before. Um, so the students who took computational physics last year got an introduction to Jupyter Notebook. I started in, uh, we we teach in C, and so but I introduced uh, Python uh, and Jupyter Notebooks at the end of the last computational physics course. So the upper level physics students who took computational physics two years ago or three years ago, some of them, and or even before that, um, they had not seen Python. And um, so I gave them the option of doing it in some, using another, something else, um, which, which, which um, was good for them, but the issue came with, when it came to, to grading, because I got, I got um, less than 50% of about 26 students used uh, Python. I got, it turned in in Excel, which I can't figure out as yet. Um, um, I had Math Mathematica. I had uh, Origin Labs. I don't know if you're familiar with this Origin Labs software. Anyone <laughs> anyone has used that? And in, in, yeah, so I have some of those, which took me forever to figure out how to how to open. Um, and and I'm still marking the assignment, and it's been about three weeks now. <laughs> um, so um, I think uh, if, uh, in a, a year, for, two years from now, when the, the course comes around again, uh, we would have uh, all the students would have used seen Python in computational physics. Um, and, and if I teach the course again, I wouldn't give them the option of doing it, you know, choosing their language or platform. Um, but it was it was a fun thing for them to do because they actually got to calculate. Um, some you know, some of these state variables for a, a complicated system that they they could visualize, but they they very difficult to um, do calculations by hand. Are you so, using Are you using Dan Schroeder's book? Yeah, okay. yep. So you know that table in the book. Right. I had them go through and um, calculate the quantities and fill in a couple of a few more columns. Yeah, it's the first time I didn't know about this book before I taught the course. It was a, it's a book that was used, uh, that they've been using here for a while at uh, River Falls. And so I just adopted it because 
we have a um, we have a tech uh, students don't purchase textbook they rent the textbooks from the university um, it's actually included in their um, tuition fee so I have to stick with the book um, so that's that's what I did um, with that but the um, computational physics um, so typically we teach this course in fall um, there's been a lot of demand for it over the past uh, few years and so now we have a, a section in spring so we we running we're doing computational physics um, each semester now that's that's my update great well thank you so my experience with uh, implementing computation this term has not been um, very successful in fact kind of a um, case study on how not to to implement computation um, basically I decided that I wanted I'm teaching applied um, optics and photonics and I decided I wanted to revamp the curriculum and put a lot more computational activities in there and so making two sets of changes at the same time uh, while trying to deal with a eight-month-old um, has proven to be a little bit more taxing. And so I'm you know, creating the lecture material, I'm creating activities, and then trying to create computational activities. And what's happened is I just ran out of time to create more computational activities. And so I kind of stopped doing it halfway through. Um, so it, you know, when I had the activities, they were working really pretty well. And I hope to um, post a couple to the pickup website. But um, yeah, that's you know, one of the messages to share to people is when you're implementing these computations, don't try to make any other changes um, at the same time, just focus on one thing. Um, so that's kind of where I am. And so at least, you know, the, when I teach this course again in two years, I'll have, you know, the first third of a semester of computational activities and I'll have all the other curriculum materials. So hopefully next time around, it'll be a little bit more successful. So um, yeah, that's where I've been. How big is the class, and do you know how they felt about stuff? Uh, it's pretty small. There are six students in there, um, and they would actually like more computational activities. Um, the, yeah, they've even said that they wish that there was more there. I've been using um, Sage Math, um, and in particular the CoCalc um, for the online classroom features. Um, but um, they like it, and they'd like more of it, so that's good at least. That's all I've got. Thanks, Todd. I like your advice. So a little bit at a time so we can keep our lives manageable. All right. Well, we have a few minutes left. Um, should we take a couple of stabs at next semester? Does anybody have anything? Uh, interesting that they're planning revamping their whole course, including their computational activities. <laughs> That's a nice. Yeah, idea. actually, I'm doing it again sec next semester too. Now that I think about it, we're starting. <laughs> we're going to be offering advanced lab for the first time, um, and I want to put computational activities in there, um, in part because um, you know the the way we're trying to work with Alpha to try to develop some computational activities that combine the, the um, experimental and computational aspects. So mm -hmm. um, that's kind of my goal is to try to put some, um, some Python modeling in there with some of the experiments that I'm also putting together. So I really haven't learned my lesson, but my, um, my delusion is that over break, I will have enough time to actually do these things. I, I realize that's not realistic, but we'll, we'll see. It'll be exciting one way or another. <laughs> yes, I'm sure it will be. Um, I'm oh. sure I'm planning on revamping my the second semester algebra based physics lab, and I'm currently talking with um, people in our department in the college, figuring out like what is the lab <laughs> um, according to them, and what can I what can I get rid of? Like, do we have to have lab reports? Do we have to have lab reports every week? Um, 
uh, how can, so like that's where I predominantly introduced computation into the um, intro level classes. I never have them do it on their own. I always have them do it in pairs together in class when I'm there. Um, uh, so that it's more about, you know, learning more about the physics material than like stressing about coding. And, um, but of course that's a time constraint. So trying to find ways to successfully do a actual lab in addition to implementing computation. And so I'm trying to just rethink, uh, what goes on in those three hours that we have and what people, um, in the department in college, uh, will let me do and still call it a lab. <laughs> Actually, Michelle, um, I wanted to mention something to you. Uh, Kelly and Walter and I were at Northwestern last week doing a pickup workshop. And um, one question that came up is, is there anything in computation similar to peer instruction? And so I mentioned the peer programming, pair programming that you've been doing. Um, and so there is some interest out there for that. That might be something that you could put together as a project and, and publish out there. I think there'd be some interest in people um, knowing what you're doing and how it works. Oh, that's really interesting, actually. So um, I, you know, a lot of my peer programming methods I take from computer science education and uh, just apply it in the physics classroom with a different goal. Um, often in why they're doing computation. Um, but recently I like have, I guess, unknowingly brought physics pedagogy into the computer science classroom. And so recently people were like, what, what are they doing in there with whiteboards? And, like, um, and they, we do the pair programming, but that's not new to them. So um, I guess I like kind of made a hybrid pedagogy that I should maybe disseminate somehow. I'm missing something. Pair programming, you said, what is that? Pair programming is two um, peers, two classmates on one computer um, working on one uh, program or task together um, at the same time. So in computer science classes um, here, uh, and, and that's like the, the common pedagogy, is even all of their homework is done that way. Um, In-class work is done that way. So it's, and also in um, industry, some companies have implemented pair programming um, in the workplace where there's one computer and two people. And the idea is that you switch off who's driving and who's helping and uh, they see better uh, learning and better productivity that way, which is um, really fascinating. I actually think I kind of pushed back on it at first. And I, even if you look back on Slack, I think it, someone else had implemented in their computational physics class before I did. And I asked a million questions because it just, you know, it, I don't know, it didn't seem like what I wanted to do, but then it, it actually is working um, quite well. And so in class, I actually like time them and I have this like Python script because they're learning Python. So then we, at some point we go through it, but he'll say like switch roles and then they like the driver switches. Um, homeworks, it's a little different, but in physics, I only do it for in-class stuff, the pair programming. Interesting. You, you said this uh, is uh, going to be done in an algebra-based physics lab? Yes, I have not taught algebra-based physics yet, so we'll see if it's as well received as it was in the calc-based class. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd be very interested to hear about it. The, the anecdote I always uh, like to tell is, so a few years ago when we introduced uh, video analysis to both the uh, college and the university physics labs, um, I happened to be in the class when the TA said, okay, today we're gonna to do the last of our video analysis experiments that was in the, the college physics lab and the whole class went, yay. <laughs> and that wasn't too encouraging. So then I asked a TA in the uh, similar university physics lab to make the same announcement. This will be today the last video analysis lab and the whole class went, oh. <laughs> I repeated that same experiment a year later, same result. Hmm. 
So I think I'm going to have a little bit biased results because um, over half of my class last semester I've had in either a uh, computer science course or calc based first semester physics. So they know what they're getting into if they have me as a professor because I always make them compute. Um, but if I go into like a first semester class, it might be different, <laughs> very different. Great. Well, it seems that we've come to the end of our time. So I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today and we hope to see you again soon. Um, and Michelle, you should definitely tell us more about that because I, I think many people would be interested in hearing more about pair programming and how to do it in the physics classroom. Um, I and... actually took pictures one day of like things in the classroom thinking that I would show it to you guys at some point, but I never did. So I think well, I'm actually prepared. Yeah, post them on Slack or maybe we could have an entire uh, online meeting devoted to something like that. So, you know, it, it could be just that or it could be something like different pedag ped pedagogies. I can't speak English. You know what I mean. Different ways of teaching. Um, <laughs> in physics that maybe everybody could share something. So, great. Well, thanks everyone. I will stop the recording and I hope to see you all soon. Good night. Thank you.